The student lecture series brings to the stage the bright and curious minds of Lewis and Clark students. Speakers and audience convene in Miller 105 every other Tuesday night at 7. regarding the whole presidential debate tonight and all that. I'm really happy you guys could spend your valuable time to my question. It means a lot to me, uh, especially because this particular topic is uh, something very dear to me. It's a, it's a passion I have and it's something I've developed, uh, particularly over the past year and a half. Um, before I continue, I just want to also just take a quick time and thank that guy over there. Uh, for the lecture series because I, I feel, and I'm sure you guys would agree that it's really important and for those who have come to uh, ones before this, uh, you can appreciate the fact that you can learn a lot more from outside the classroom as you can from inside the classroom. So let's hope that uh, when this is done, I'd encourage everyone to you know, put pressure on the school and all that to encourage more of these talks and debates on a student level. Um, just to give you a little bit of background uh, regarding this topic, and. Uh, for those that don't know, Sino is a IA term used when describing China in relationship with other, with other countries. So specifically, this is the China-US struggle for Mozambique's resources and the role of the young generation. Um, the reason for this passion really started, I'd say, about a year and a half ago. Um, and that was definitely when I was in uh, DC for the 2010 fall. And I had the pleasure of uh, working for the World Bank. And my responsibilities for the World Bank revolved around uh, me and myself and the second aide, we worked for uh, the regional director of food security for Sub-Saharan Africa. And our daily struggles just came by with uh, flowery slideshows, and most of the time we just had to do a lot of paperwork for our, my director. However, this, from the other point, I was also able to see a lot of uh, the backdoor negotiations that go on, and the fact that the World Bank was covered with a lot of people who were very arrogant and were very staunch on their, on their scholarly work. And they applied their, their economics and their business savvy to countries that they'd never been to, or for example, didn't even know the primary language. Um, an interesting example was where, um, actually, I'll say this for later, it's better that way. So just um, talking about what, what this presentation is going to do, it has two main, main, um, main objectives. And it's the misconceptions of the continent and the new dimension. When I talk about misconceptions of the continent, uh, I'm sure you guys know that there are a lot of stereotypes that go with Africa. I mean, from AIDS, as in, you guys can just call them out, as you know, in famine, conflict, conflict poverty. Poverty. poverty, exactly. So there are all these stereotypes. And truthfully, these things exist, and they're true. But I want to show you a different side. And you might ask why I want to show you that different side. And the principal reason is that I have two, two principal reasons for this. The one is that most of these, um, how do I say, the data you see and the TVs you see with the baby starving and people with uh, flies in their eyes or whatever the case may be, these things are true, but they're tailored to get that effect out of it because at the end of the day, these, companies, these organizations run on, run on uh, funding, private funding. And the only way that anyone would be willing to fund these, these organizations is if you feel the need to do so, there's an urgency to do so. So inherently, uh, regardless of where the organization is doing positively or negatively in a particular country, the way in which it gets this money and manifests, manifests this money is a bad thing because it portrays to the rest of the world that Africa is just a destitute, filled with conflicts, HIV, AIDS, etc., etc. et cetera, as you guys just mentioned it. The second reason, and I think is probably the most important, is that the only capable way of action and to solve these stereotypes that you guys mentioned is through strong governance and a strong society. The only way you can get a strong government is to a strong society and a strong economy. You, can't, you, you just can't achieve it without that. And as a result, I really want to focus on these two principal um, concepts as we go through my presentation as much as to think about it and apply it not only to Mozambique but to Africa because they're interchangeable just like that. Um, oh, and just one quick slight uh, note. I have a lot of data and a lot of facts behind most of the things I'm going to say. A lot of the things that, I, that uh, I present to you are my own opinions, and they're formulated by facts and data. And if, for the purposes of this presentation, I didn't put them up on the slideshow as I would bore you, and that's not what I want to do. It bored me. So there's a, a paper over there with the name and emails, and if you guys would like to know if what, I'm, if what I'm saying is really true, 
I backed it up and I can, I'll be more than happy to send it to you guys via email. I just didn't think it would be worth um, putting it here on the slideshow. So as I said, I wanted to present a new dimension as well. The dimension I want to present is one really unique and one that's never done, been done before, and that is my own view, my own eyes. That is something that I have the authority to do, and it's something that I know that whatever my opinions are, they're mine, and you either take it or you leave it. But what I want you to do is to at least leave this door with at least an added value, and you have that advantage over your classmate in particular classes, where you know something about Mozambique, you know something about the condition of um, global powers and the way they affect countries in Africa. And so what I mean by my view, I talk about my view because you'd be surprised, but I have a lot more in common with a lot of you sitting here today than you think I do. And I guess the opportune place to start is my life, my background. So I was born in Mozambique, but when I was four, uh, we moved to Switzerland, Lausanne, Switzerland, and I lived there for two years. After being in Switzerland, I came to Johannesburg, South Africa, where I lived for four years. And ultimately, we went back to Mozambique when I was in grade five, so I was 10. And after I was 10, I, I was in uh, Maputo for three years. Maputo is a capital of Mozambique. And then I ended up going to Swaziland for seven years. Why this is significant is because I got to see Mozambique and Maputo in phases, in phases of six to three months. Um, I came in, I came out, I came in, I came out, and all this time Mozambique was ever changing. Infrastructure-wise, socially, climate-wise, it was just changing. And I thought, I thought that, that was pretty valuable, and it's an interesting perspective because I get to step back from the nitty-gritty of the day-to-day -day politics, and I get to fully understand what that change means. And when I saw that change, it made me think, what does that change mean for me? What role do I play in that, in that change? It was, it was kind of overwhelming because people are talking about all these changes that are happening, and when I come, I'm like a visitor. And so it was definitely something I was really concerned about, and as I grew older, and I start thinking about my careers and my life, these changes are gonna influence me directly. And so I felt that it was definitely something that I developed a passion for in it. And by virtue of developing a passion, my career will then fall into place and my life will fall into place based on my understanding of where Mozambique is going. And uh, that is a very important point because it, 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 it's the fundamental base of my passion. And what that means is that regardless of what you see here in the points, you guys need to take what you want from it. And you need to apply that to your particular lives, your particular case studies, your particular passions, whether that be a country, organization, group, whatever the case may be. This is a night picture, as you can see, of uh, the world. Now, obviously, the world is never dark the whole way through, so what they did is they took slight pictures and they put them together. Obviously, recognizable is the East Coast lights, uh, European lights, Japan over there, uh, these bright lights over here are in Brazil, particularly Rio de Janeiro. And the brightest light, I don't know if you can see uh, because of this light, would be this one over here, which is Johannesburg. And that is the only brightest visible light when you don't use Photoshop to brighten the, the dimmest lights in Africa. The result of this picture was the adoption name for Africa given, which was the dark continent. That is one way to look at it. But when I looked at it, it just looks like endless possibilities. All that, granted, all this space, here's the Congo Basin, and you've got the Sahara Desert there, so you shouldn't expect to see many lights over there. But if you look at the coastal regions, much like Europe, United States, South America, Australia on this side, and Japan all over, there's clearly like a need for development, and there's a, there's a lack of it in, in uh, Africa, um, testimony, testimony to the fact that we need to invest in that. Um, so, you might ask why, why, why is it important to bring up Mozambique? Why, I mean, yes, I'm from Mozambique and it's advantageous for me to come here and talk to you about Mozambique, but there, is, there needs to be a two-way thing here. You need to get something out of this too. And Mozambique is a, has a population of 23 million people, and over the past three years, these have been our biggest achievements. Uh, last year was the first year that we exported our first uh, shipment, shipment load of coal. So far, $50 billion has been invested to date in coal. And that's only dealing with the United States. The United States alone and the United States companies have put in $50 billion. If you add in China, India, uh, Brazil, and Japan, 
that goes up to $320 billion. That is a lot, lot of money. The same can be said for natural gas. Um, it ranks third in gas reserves, and it's where I was working when I was there over the summer. I worked at an American company called Anadarko in Mozambique. Now, I'll get into the details about what, Anag what Anadarko does and all that later, but uh, that's very specific because I was able to be on the ground and truly see the magnitude. And I kid you not when I say that it's, 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 it's probably twice the size of Portland, and we're talking about a company that built up there. Uh, as you can see, I talked about the $60 billion projected rate of revenue. Mozambique has never made that much in its history up to date. And that's how much it's expected to make in easily five years. And that's once we start exporting natural gas and coal. We're their large customers and their large consumers, and it's very viable. Lastly, we have Kabora Basa, which is a Gaelic name, and it means moving water. This is a man-made dam in Mozambique. It costs $4 billion, and it's the largest supplier of South African electricity. Why is that important? Because South Africa is arguably the most developed country in Africa. It has the most educated population, and it has the most tertiary products. What that means is that most of their products, although they range between uh, agricultural to manufacturing, they're not focusing largely on cars, TVs, computers, etc. So they're a very important um, trading partner for us. Um, we also know in global politics that when we talk about money, money, money is politics. And as a result, because of all these recent discoveries, we've had an incredible um, interest in Mozambique, particularly from America, as I mentioned, Anadarko. China is another big uh, position. We've got uh, Brazil, who's that, um, who focuses more on coal, and India as well, who's in coal. As you can see, there is a pattern here. Most of Mozambique's exports are, resource, are um, primary resources. I don't know how many of you have heard of the resource, the resource curse, but the resource curse revolves around the theory that developing countries rely heavily on um, primary resources. As a result, the government is not accountable to the government, I mean to, the, to its people, meaning it doesn't need taxes, it doesn't need to make sure that people are eating, it doesn't need to make sure that people are going to school because it gets money strictly from its resources. That's obviously a problem, and what's happened is that it's caused these historical downturns. Congo, till this day, is a failed state in many, in many, in many um, regards, particularly because of coal. Coal is what's used in cell phones, and so what they do is that they take the coal from Congo, they take it to the United States, where it's processed, and into Europe, where it's manufactured. Warlords have control of all the coal that mines in, um, in Congo. As a result, there's a continuing war between the government and the rebels for control of this coal. Angola also has a similar past, as it's incredibly rich in oil and diamonds, particularly diamonds. And as a result, the government actually gave people diamond mines. And the, uh, a whole family can own a diamond mine. And one diamond mine can even contribute to Mozambique's GDP for one year. So these families make ridiculous amounts of money. Same thing with Nigeria. And I mentioned Biafra because a slight history lesson, but um, in 1967, uh, the state of uh, Biafra is a state in Nigeria. It called for its succession because it found five oil rigs, and they decided they wanted to be a country. They could be self-sustainable. They didn't need to be part of Nigeria. There was also divisions between Christianity and Islam. It was more reason to do so. That ended, that ended in a four-year war where three million people died. 800,000 were children through starvation. Only 500,000 were shot. Everyone else was through starvation because what Nigeria did is they just um, closed up the Biafra border and let no one in or out. Sudan, um, which is now presently North and South Sudan, also shares a similar history, whereby it's rich in oil. As a result, the North, that was uh, Muslim, was fighting against the South, which is Christian. The South is where the oil is. The South doesn't want to be part of Sudan. The South wants to be alone. The North doesn't want Sudan to be alone. So you can imagine what, um, what tragedy that causes. Now, um, this, let me just read this out loud with you guys. So it says, recently the National Intelligence Council estimated that the US imported 18% of its oil from Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll just stop there. When they mean Sub-Saharan Africa, they mean all the countries below the Sahara Desert. Almost the same amount as Saudi Arabia. 
This amount is expected to increase to 25% in the next 10 years. Africa offers diversification away from Middle East oil for both the US and Europe, and also access to new gas reserves. Um, I highlighted the importance of the, cent the phrase increase to 25% in the next 10 years, because that 25% is going to come from Southern Africa, particularly Angola, Mozambique, and South Africa. When you see that, when I see it as a Mozambican, for example, it makes me wonder what exactly does that mean? How a country, if the US is now incredibly interested in Mozambique, that means you're buying a larger stake in Mozambique. That means China's buying a larger stake in Mozambique. What does that mean for my career? What does that mean for my life? What we have is a resource-rich paradigm. Now this is a concept that, as far as I know, hasn't been, uh, or should I say these factors haven't been coupled like this. This came across to me when I worked at Anadarko in Mozambique. I was working in the north of Mozambique for six months. Anadarko is a natural gas company, as I explained. They have uh, companies all over, they have sorry, subsets all over the world. Their biggest is now in Mozambique. They own 80% of the natural gas in Mozambique. Um, being, being in the company as a Mozambican was a very interesting um, experience because my bosses are American. They currently are American. I'm currently working for Enedarco. It's an 18-month program. You, you're trained for 18 months in order to be on the field, in and out of the offices or whatever. So right now, I was hired as an unofficial intern with the likelihood of uh, working for Enedarco. Well, anyway, through, through working with Enedarco, I was um, charged with heading a team of seven people. And these people, our responsibility was to look at the corporate responsibility that Anadarko had to its people. What it meant is that it looked at you know, health, it looked at education, all that, and made sure that Anadarko was playing its part with the government to make sure that its workers and the area were being self-sustainable. This, uh, this touches on the MNC complex. MNC stands for Multinational Corporation, which means it's a business, it's a company that is in another country, but its headquarters is in its home country. For example, Anadarko is an MNC. Its head, uh, headquarters is in Texas, and it is all over the world. I'm sorry if this seems repetitive, but there are a lot of people who really don't understand this, so I'd rather just cover that like that. There are both positive and negative outcomes when we deal with the MNC complex. Perhaps the, arguably one of, one of the biggest problems with the, with the multinational corporation is the negative outcomes it comes with. A multinational corporation exists to make profits. Therefore, if there are certain conditions in the country that don't necessitate it to, to be improved, they won't do it. And Adarko did this. For example, uh, there were 72 villages that were directly affected by Anadarko. What that meant is that all the men in those villages worked at Anadarko. It meant that all the women in the village somehow sold fruit or whatever to sustain the men or the work or the um, clients of Anadarko. Um, as a result, we, there was this awkward moment where us as the corporate responsibility team had to go to our American bosses and say that you yourself are purposely avoiding these um, how do you say, responsibilities for the villages because you're trying to maximize your profits. They literally just turned the other cheek and say, oh, but that's the government's responsibility and it goes vice versa. Consequently, there are also positive aspects to the multinational corporation. Uh, again, when we went to these villages and these problems arose, we then, uh, we then understood that um, Anadarko had a responsibility to play. And after years of, actually months of going back and forth with the government, Anadarko agreed to build schools in all the villages and hospitals in all the villages. Of course, you can see this is positive. It turns out to work out for the villages. The second one is the increased likelihood of global power pressures. What this means is that when you have the United States, India, China, buying their stakes into um, Mozambique, that phrase becomes very true. If it's my money, it's my business. What that means is that all of a sudden, Mozambican politics becomes the business of America, because there's American money in that. It becomes the business of China politics. It becomes the business of India politics. Um, just to play the devil's advocate, what that would mean is, for example, if Mozambique tomorrow decided that it no longer wants to export all its most of its coal to the United States, and the United States, which it does presently, as I showed you in the previous, excuse me, in the previous slide, 18% of 
of its imported oils and gas comes from Southern Africa. If that was to be in jeopardy, what, did, what, did, what are the consequences? Do we, uh, does America then invade? Does America then do COVID operations? These are questions that are very serious and although people might think it's far too out of the box, it does happen and you see that translates in Libya. You see that translates in Sudan. Lastly is civil war and ethnic conflicts. Um, as I mentioned, the chances of this happening are pretty small for the fact that Mozambique is unique in the sense that there's no type of uh, ethnic differences. Uh, it's definitely a, a country built on nationalism, which means that you're not distinguished based on your religion or what part of the country you come from, you're Mozambique. Um, as you know, this, this is a condition that is not prevalent in a lot of African countries, particularly East, sorry, East and West Africa, whereby the tribe you come from and the religion you are dictate your successes in life, particularly during the colonial times. To get more into, into what I'm talking about, we need to understand what this means for me, what this means for you. And when I mean you, I truly mean like Kai, I mean an American, an American citizen, I mean a non-Mozambican citizen. Because there's no point you being here if at the end of this, this doesn't change your life at all. The first aspect is a job, is a job market, and it's grown exponentially. As a Mozambican, that's a threat to me. What that means is that I now have to compete with all of you sitting in this, in, in this front row who are vying for the same jobs I want to. Uh, as a result, Mozambique is constantly playing catch-up. We can't afford to then close our, gate, uh, close our borders and say, no, only Mozambicans are going to work at Anadarko. Only Mozambicans are going to work at the Chinese companies. We have to open our gates and accept everyone who meets the requirements to work in those jobs. English has now made its way into the workplace. Uh, that's something that's never happened before. Portuguese is the official language in Mozambique. If you don't speak Portuguese, you can't communicate with the government at all. English is not even the second, third, or fourth language. English is only if you were educated in English. You, you could, it's very rare for you to be able to order food in English even because English is just non-existent. This has changed over the past five years, particularly because of the influx of uh, workers for Anadarko and other companies. Just to give you an example, um, over the summer, I was talking to a friend, uh, actually having lunch at a restaurant during our, our work, our lunch break. And we were talking about how many Chinese came in this month. And you notice these things because it's a small, it's a small town. And everyone who, who lives there works for a company. Whether it's Chinese, American, almost everyone has something to do with the effects of the multinational corporations. So we were sitting in this restaurant and we were talking about, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean, because we were talking about Botswana and the fact that Botswana does not have, now has recent xenophobia against Chinese. What this means is that a lot of the Botswana uh, locals feel that the Chinese are taking their jobs. And as a result, a lot of Botswana went out to the, to the, to the cities and um, abused or, or threatened or harassed a lot of Chinese workers, scaring them out. This hasn't happened in Mozambique. And as I was saying that, we looked around and the restaurant was basically a virtual pie chart because the table behind us was covered in Chinese people speaking Portuguese fluently. Behind us were Americans speaking Portuguese fluently. We had Ghanaians, we had Kenyans, and we even had Egyptians. This then obviously is testament to the job market growing because we are now competing in a global market. There is no such thing as a difference between Kyle being attainable for Anna Darko and myself. There is no difference at all. Very close to that point is the fact that there's a lack of skilled workers in Mozambique. Um, Specialized companies like this require, at minimum, master's degrees. Mozambique only has one, two universities, and the rate at which people come out of these universities isn't fast enough to meet the demands of the companies. As a result, this is where non-Mozambican non, uh, citizens come in, and the Mozambican government's actually putting initiatives and incentives for non-citizens to then come and gain citizenship and work here, at least for the interim point where we need to fill in these vocational gaps. Um, probably most significantly is the Euro and other economic downturns. I specifically mentioned Euro because that's where Portugal is. For those that have been keeping with the news, Portugal has gone through its worst economic crisis since its existence. Uh, 
if I'm not mistaken, last time I checked, the unemployment level in Portugal reached 22%. Uh, Portuguese are coming in the truck loads, well, in this case, plane loads, to Mozambique. Um, and obviously this is, this is affecting our economy. What this means is, number one, Portugal was a colonial power, so we also have that inference. And when, we, when they left in 1975, they just left, and now they're just coming. And there are a lot of unresolved issues from that, whereby the Portuguese were accused of purposely um, sabotaging a lot of the institutions that they were going to leave behind and they couldn't literally pack and take with them. And as a result, there's a lot of tension about what roles should the Portuguese play and should they be identified as um, coming after Mozambicans or, in, in that case, after any other, any other um, nationality. America recently is coming out of an economic downturn. That was the principal reason why in a dark in the first place even started looking at Mozambique in terms of doing drilling to find natural gas and coal. Uh, China is heavy, heavily reliant on external economies because it doesn't have a large enough working population. China's population leads towards its elders, meaning that according to calculation, in 15 years, the working class won't be able to sustain the pensions and retirement funds of the elderly. What that means is that China um, really relies on uh, foreign capital to come from countries like Mozambique. These are uh, factors that China is not willing to play with. What that means is that when they come and when they install their companies, they bring their workers. They, bring, they use their materials, they use their food and whatever, as much as possible to create Mozambique as an external economy. What that means is that we, get, we, be, we benefit very little from China coming in because they don't use our products. And then we have hidden jewels being exposed. Mostly prior to the discovery of a lot of coal and natural gas, always had beautiful beaches, always had beautiful forests, incredible fishing, and po I mentioned poaching here, but their hunting is a sport. And funny enough, Americans actually make up most of the hunting trips, the hunting parties that come to uh, um, Mozambique specifically. Uh, I was just thinking of the prices today. You pay $7,000 for the opportunity to kill your own lion. And you can't take the lion out of Mozambique, but the fact that you killed it is apparently gratifying. Anyway, going back to um, the tourism, and I'll just go down. I just jumped ahead. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, we have very many beautiful beaches. And what it means is that now people know about these beaches, and now they're coming to Mozambique. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the hotels. We don't have the restaurants to, to, to meet these capacities. These are jobs that are available for me, for you, for us, to then fill in. The same can be said for forestry. We have huge timber fields, and we need them for um, electricity poles, for the finishing touches on roads, etc. Again, huge gap in having employed workers for that. Um, the fishing sector is an interesting one because uh, we have international waters, meaning that no one holds jurisdiction in those waters. But, however, the problem with that is that a lot of, there are no borders in the ocean. So fish trans, I mean, go this way and that way, whatever the case may be. Chinese ships over the past three months have been off the coast of Mozambique. It's estimated that they have actually wiped out a particular species only, only found in the Indian Ocean. So that goes from Mozambique all the way to Kenya. That fish no longer exists. It's, a, it's a, a cousin of the grouper fish? Grouper fish, yes. It's a cousin of the grouper fish. It no longer exists. And as a result, we now have uh, WWF and other organizations that are actually surrounding our coast and making sure that this, these types of things don't happen. And lastly, as I mentioned, uh, hunting has become a sport. And as we have more and more people coming to do this sport, we don't have enough cabins. We don't have enough laws and licenses to, to let them do this. And as a result, they result to poaching. Just yesterday, I was reading that 250 tusks were found in a man's uh, truck who was taken to South Africa with the hopes of taking it to Korea for medicinal reasons. This means that the challenge really is accepted. And what I mean by that is that I, as a Mozambican citizen, as an educated Mozambican citizen, have a responsibility to make sure that these changes and the transformations happening in Mozambique is done the right way in ways that benefit me, my people, and the people who come to visit my country. The fact that Mozambique 
is a very young nation. To be honest, it's, actually, it's 37 years old, and you've only had four presidents. Compared to America, that is nothing. Compared to a lot of countries in the world, that is nothing. This is actually, it works as a benefit for us because we have the advantage of looking back at other countries, specifically the countries I mentioned before, like Angola, Congo, and Sudan. They went through the same resource conflict paradigms. And obviously we can look at their trials and their tribulations and see what works and what doesn't work. With that being said, that will never be enough because we also have to make sure that there are legal structures. We need to make sure that the laws are, are updated and that the licenses are created. There's no such thing as a, a excuse me, just remind me what you call a master's in law. A JD. A JD, yes. There's no such thing as a JD for Mozambican law, particularly in environmental, environmental law and coastal law, which means that all our lawyers in those, in those regards are foreigners. All of them, every single one. As a matter of fact, when I say all, I only need three in the whole country. And then there are opportunities on a micro level. And this is something that I really want to focus on because it, it's something that affects all of us because it, it, it covers a whole array of businesses. As a result of the macroeconomic um, growth that's happening in Mozambique, we, there are a lot of businesses that are opening. In Anadarko, where I was working, we had no running water, no electricity, no electricity during midday, and I know of a lot of colleagues who ended up sleeping in their cars because it was more comfortable than where they were staying. There are not enough hotels, there are not enough restaurants. These are cities that are virtually built as a result of these companies. And the investment opportunity in this sense is huge, but people don't know about it. And this is why I hope that by me at least highlighting these, these factors, you guys can take your time and go and do your research and see if there's any niche or any particular, not just in Mozambique, but around the world, because the American economy is struggling very deeply. And Lewis and Clark students love to travel. And I would encourage you, and I, I'm not here to pitch Mozambique at all, but I really <laughs> would encourage you to try, to try and find niches in other parts of the world where you can exploit these. I mean exploit in a nice term because you have to have responsibility rather than entitlement. And what that means is that you need, we need to go into these countries very, very aware of the implications that, that we have there. Meaning that we, when we treat with the local workers, when we, when we receive salaries, we need to make sure that, that they're done the proper way. And, pardon, sorry, excuse me, there's just, yes, and just mentioning the anadarko bit, just mentioned the Anadarko bit to do with responsibility and entitlement. There are many aspects where Anadarko, Anadarko workers um, would use prostitutes. They would, um, sorry, I just, I just lost that page. But they would use prostitutes. They would uh, improve the informal market, meaning that they would uh, find backdoor ways to make sure that alcohol and, and uh, vegetables and food reach them. This is a huge, huge problem in Mozambique because we can't calculate that. There's no way to quantify um, the influx of goods coming in and out. Just tracking back, what does this mean for us, an American student? I, when I was at the World Bank, there was a very interesting thing that happened, which was that we had to uh, work with Mozambican artists and try and create a, a, time, uh, a, a window of opportunity for them in the United States. We went to many schools, we went to George Washington, Georgetown University, and introduced this idea of bringing Mozambican products into, into the United States, and then there would be an exchange of, vice versa, of, of American students going into Mozambique, but in the uh, uh, professional, uh, professional sector. When we went to Georgetown, for example, half of the students didn't even know what Mozambique was. When we went to George Washington, we found that people actually thought the Mozambique was in Asia. The problem with this is that we, we hear about Mozambique. I gave you a presentation about Mozambique today, and tomorrow this has no reference into what you do for the rest of your life. I want you guys to leave here with an added value, just understanding that this place exists and there are opportunities for you guys to invest in this place, and most, most specifically, enforce that governments and uh, organizations around the world invested in this place do it the right way. That's the end of my presentation. I hope you guys liked it. And